We hate to besmirch the good name of Rick Sanchez, but we have to say that he doesn't always get it right. No, not when it comes to his interpersonal relationships, he almost always manages to bungle those. We're actually talking about the science behind Rick and Morty. The show's writing is undeniably clever, but it does get some pretty big things wrong when it comes to science. That's right, even Rick Sanchez isn't about throwing around sci-fi buzzwords like neutronium every now and then. And we probably don't have to explain to you why shrinking someone down and sending them inside someone else is a bad idea, but we're gonna do it anyway. If you feel guilty thinking about all the things Rick and Morty got wrong, then celebrate the things they got right by visiting our friends at Screen Rant and checking out actual science stuff Rick and Morty got right. Anatomy Park is the third episode of Rick and Morty and kind of reminds us of a very popular movie we just can't put our finger on at the moment. I'm sure it'll come to me. But we're pretty sure that that movie didn't involve a homeless person dressed up as Santa who has a theme park constructed inside of him. While Rick may not have spared any expense creating his anatomy a park, he didn't get the science quite right. While the gang is doing their best to escape Hepatitis A, they head to the respiratory system and enter a door labeled Alveoli Forest. Now, an alveolus is a tiny air sac located in your lungs, which allows the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. There are about 300 million of them in your lungs, and each one is somewhere from 200 to 500 micrometers in diameter. Although we're not exactly sure how tiny Morty is in this episode, he seems comparable in size to the alveolus he encounters. Now let's talk about how small viruses like the ones we see attacking Morty are. Viruses are even smaller than bacteria, which Anatomy Park depicts as being tinier than the humans and Dr. Bloom. Viruses are usually about 20 to 400 nanometers in diameter. If Morty is comparable in size to a small alveolus, then he's about 200,000 nanometers in diameter, or way bigger than a virus. Love potions are a pretty common trope in fiction. We've seen them in everything from Harry Potter to Batman and Robin. Of course, they don't usually result in the world being taken over by Cronenberg monsters, but hey, Rick and Morty is always going the extra mile. In the episode Rick Potion No. 9, Morty begs his grandfather to help him out by hooking him up with a love potion that will get his crust Jessica to fall in love with him. Ignoring the serious moral ramifications of this, the potion goes terribly wrong when the flu virus causes the effect of the potion to spread. Although it's not very romantic, Rick is correct when he says the emotion we call love is just a chemical reaction. He claims the potion contains oxytocin, which is a hormone that does indeed promote bonding and attachment, but it's not enough to get someone falling head over heels. There are many things which influence our attraction to people like testosterone, adrenaline, and serotonin. There's no way a one-size-fits-all dose of oxytocin would get the job done. In the episode Close Recounters of the Rick Kind, Involves, well, a lot of Ricks. There's also an obscene amount of Mortys as well, but not all of them live happy, carefree lives of leisure. In fact, tons of them are used to shield a particular Rick. The Rick Sanchez we all know and uh, love is, is a strong word. Let's just say are familiar with. Explains that he and his fellow Ricks have a very distinctive brainwave due to their intelligence. He reasons that these Mortys are being used to block out Rick brainwaves from being detected, but that's just not how brainwaves work. First of all, brain waves aren't really waves. They're electrical impulses traveling through your brain and body. They just look like waves when they're shown during an EEG, but they don't actually travel through your skull and outside your body, which means they're not something that you can detect from a distance. Your brain isn't radiating waves, it's just using electrical impulses. Someone would have to get incredibly close to Rick in order to be able to figure out what his brain waves look like, so the idea of detecting them from such a great distance doesn't make sense. Rick throws out a lot of terms the average non-scientist isn't familiar with. No, you don't really need to have a solid grasp of theoretical physics to enjoy the show, especially since sometimes Rick is just talking nonsense. In the episode Auto-Erotic Assimilation, Rick, Summer, and Morty follow a distress signal and end up running into Rick's old girlfriend, Unity. They also stumble upon something Rick calls powdered neutronium and asks Unity if she knows what they can make with it. The answer to that is pretty much nothing. Neutronium does sound pretty futuristic, and that's probably why it's used a lot in science fiction. It's usually portrayed as matter from the core of a neutron star, and that is incredibly hard and dense. But the reality is that pretty much everything we know about a neutron star core material says this substance would be extremely unstable, unless it was kept in an insanely high pressure. 
At best, neutronium is a sci-fi buzzword, and at worst, it would just explode if Rick actually tried working with it. It may sound more scientific than a quantum carburetor, but it's just as nonsensical if you actually think about it. Sometimes it's disappointing to know our favorite sci-fi moments could never happen in real life, but other times it's more than a relief. Like in the episode Raising Gazorpazorp when Rick buys Morty a souvenir so he can remember all their adventures together. <laughs> yeah, sure, let's go with that. Morty and his vaguely humanoid robot go on to have a definitely platonic relationship, and then the robot gets pregnant. We can't believe Morty's health class didn't teach him the ins and outs of responsible robot ownership. Morty names the creature born from the robot Morty Jr. since it contains half of his DNA. But what are the odds of an alien and a human being able to breed with one another and actually produce an offspring? Well, let's think about the fact that humans and chimpanzees share 99% of their DNA sequences, but they're still too different to make it work. Yes, there may have been periods where our ancestors could have crossbred with one another, but that's no longer the case. There's actually a long and frankly unsettling history of people trying to create human-chimp hybrids with no luck. So the odds of a human being able to reproduce with a completely alien species are ridiculously minimal. There are plenty of less than scientific moments in Rick and Morty, but you might be surprised at how potentially feasible some of the more out there aspects of the show are, like Rick's infamous portal gun, which could theoretically create a hole in the space-time between parallel dimensions. It hinges on the idea of a multiverse, sure, but it's a sci-fi concept vaguely grounded in realism. But when a similar type of technology is used in the episode Lawnmower Dog, it's all wrong. And we're not just talking about the part when Rick and Morty find Summer in Mr. Goldenfold's dream. Ew. In an effort to improve Morty's math grade, Rick and Morty venture inside the dreams of his teacher, Mr. Goldenfold. Once they're in that dream, they're able to travel from dream to dream while being pursued by Freddy Krueger. Uh, we mean Scary Terry. But dreams are just hallucinations which occur during REM sleep. There's no place to travel to, so you can't go inside someone's dream. And even if you could, people's dreams aren't connected to one another. There's no multiverse of dreams, so Rick and Morty wouldn't be able to hop from dream to dream like they do in the show. You're probably familiar with the old thought experiment. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? The Rick and Morty episode The Wedding Squanchers put a new spin on that old classic by asking, if the sun screams in outer space, would you hear it? When Rick and his family are fleeing from the Federation, they're forced to pick from some less than ideal new homes. One of these planets seems pretty much perfect, except for the fact that the sun screams constantly. Our sun may not scream, but it's actually incredibly loud, way louder than you might think. When you see how active it is up close, this makes sense, but why can't we hear it? That's because sound waves simply can't travel through the vacuum of space. Sound travels by creating changes in pressure, and for that you need an atmosphere. Even if our sun was literally screaming, we wouldn't be able to hear it on Earth. It produces about 380,000 yotta watts per second, which means it's about 290 decibels. For reference, a jet engine is around 140 decibels, but thanks to the vacuum of space, we can't hear it, just like the Smith family wouldn't be able to hear the sun screaming. <laughs> it is pretty hilarious, though. Looking back to the episode Anatomy Park, we see Rick utilizing some impressive shrinking technology. He sends a mini Morty into Anatomy Park, and his diminutive grandson is able to function just fine. But there are some very real roadblocks to shrinking technology. Even if Rick theoretically could shrink Morty, the result wouldn't be what you see on the show. To shrink someone, you'd have to either shrink their very atoms, or you'd have to reduce the number of atoms making them up. And as you probably guessed, shrinking atoms is pretty much impossible because the distances between the protons and neutrons and their electrons are fixed. If Rick somehow managed to get around this, then the resulting tiny Morty would just be incredibly dense. So much so that he just might sink into the Earth, which means there's no chance of getting him into Anatomy Park. As far as removing atoms, that's impractical for different reasons. You need a certain amount of atoms in order to maintain your strands of DNA, and messing with that, well, think Cronenberg monster, yeah. And shrinking Morty would be shrinking his lungs, which would dramatically limit the rate of diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. It would also mess with his metabolic rate, causing him to burn energy so quickly, he would have to eat continually just in order to stay alive. Being small comes with tons of issues, but growing giant is also problematic. Rick can not only shrink things, but he's able to make them grow to enormous sizes as well. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we've seen Ant-Man grow enormous using his super suit, but he claims the experience is exhausting. But really, he wouldn't be able to pack a very powerful bunch if he grew to that size, let alone how huge Reuben gets in Anatomy Park. Just like shrinking someone would make them more dense, expanding them would make them less dense. 
Ruben would basically be like a big giant Macy's Day float gone rogue, making him squishy and ineffectual. He would hardly be capable of taking down entire mountain ranges at that size. And that's if we could get the science behind a growth rate down in the first place, which, by the way, we can't. Making atoms further apart from each other isn't more feasible than squishing them together like we talked about earlier. There are tons of devices we've seen on Rick and Morty that we wouldn't mind having in real life. How many of us would say no to having a spaceship or a portal gun? Let's talk about one of the science fiction elements from the episode Morty Night Run, where Rick and Morty go to an intergalactic arcade called Blips and Chits. While there, Morty plays a virtual reality game called Roy, A Life Well Lived, where he takes on the role of Roy and lives out, well, a life well lived. We aren't exactly sure how much time passed in the real world, but in the virtual world, Morty spent years living as Roy, which made the game ending extremely traumatic. If you've ever lost track of time playing a video game, this may not seem that far-fetched. After all, it is actually possible for virtual reality to make its users feel as though time is progressing quickly. The secret to this is repeating the way the sun shines on Earth and just speeding it up, so we perceive time as moving faster than it really is. But this only works up to a certain extent. It definitely doesn't let people experience years in a matter of minutes. Also, using virtual reality for too long can mess with your spatial awareness and can even cause seizures and nausea. Morty's perception of time shouldn't have been so compromised, and he would have had more trouble adjusting to the real world than we were shown. Sometimes Rick manages to create some truly amazing things, but even the most simple of his inventions can have unintended consequences. Like why did he have to make his butter dispensing device capable of existential terror? But then there's Aberdolf Linkler, who we met in the episode Rixy Business, that makes you wonder what his best case scenario was. Linkler is Rick's attempt at creating a morally neutral super leader by combining the DNA of Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler. Jeez, what could ever go wrong with that plan? Creating a new life from two biological males is something science has been thinking about for quite some time. Researchers have even created mice without the use of traditional egg cells in the past, but taking it to the human level is something else entirely. Let's forget about the ethical concerns here, since this is Rick we're talking about. The idea of this technique ever being used on humans is speculative at best, and you'd still need someone to incubate the embryo. Somehow we have a feeling that it would be a bit difficult to get a willing participant for this highly unlikely science. Seriously, if the best case scenario is giving birth to the child of Adolf Hitler and Abraham Lincoln, then maybe it's not a good idea. And speaking of controversial ideas, Rick and Morty isn't afraid to tackle the real issues, like is Pluto a planet? In the episode is Something Ricked This Way Comes, Jerry becomes insecure about his intelligence and decides to harp on his belief that Pluto is a planet. He and Morty end up on Pluto, where Jerry is celebrated for his incorrect insistence. But of course it turns out Jerry is just being used as a distraction while corporations mine the valuable plutonium from Pluto's core, causing the planet to become unstable. But in the real world, plutonium exists right here on Earth. Since Neptunium could have been named after the planet Neptune, and Uranium was named after the planet Uranus, this element discovered in 1941 became known as plutonium. It could have been used as a source of energy the way Scroopy Noopers describes, for it's been used in radioisotope thermoelectric generators. In fact, plutonium was even used to power the New Horizons mission when it did a flyby of Pluto. Although this element helped us get a closer look at the planet Pluto, that's not where it comes from. The core of the planet is probably just rocks surrounded by ice. In the episode Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, Rick manages to shrink himself without using a shrinking machine. Instead, he transfers his consciousness into a younger version of himself called Tiny Rick. Woohoo, Tiny Rick! Of course, we know that our memories and everything that makes us us is stored in our brains. That makes this process of transferring your mind kinda complicated. It's something we've seen a lot of in sci-fi, but as of now, it belongs in the realm of Black Mirror and not reality. Most scientists believe that in order to observe a brain enough to emulate it, the brain would be destroyed in the process. And putting together a completely neutral network is pretty much as impossibly complex as it sounds. Plus, in this scenario, you'd have to map an existing brain onto another existing brain, which is a whole thing, since even clones aren't exact copies. It would actually probably be easier to upload your consciousness into a computer than trying to recreate your brain in another human body. If you're a fan of Marvel movies or comic books, then you're probably all too familiar with the idea of a multiverse. Basically, the idea is that we live in a multiverse which contains many different parallel universes. The fictional world of Rick and Morty takes place within a multiverse, and we've seen many examples of these different worlds. While there are many scientists who believe we exist within a multiverse, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and the late Stephen Hawking, there are many others who think it's a ridiculous idea which would be impossible to prove. 
Even some astrophysicists take issue with presenting the multiverse as fact. In Rick Potion No. 9, Rick screws up his own timeline, so he and Morty go to another, where they happen to pass right away around that time. He claims that there are an infinite number of other universes, but even if there was a multiverse, it definitely doesn't have infinite possibilities. Current predictions estimate about one with 500 zeros after it, which is unfathomably huge, but still less than infinity. But it still makes Rick encountering other versions of Rick, especially so many of them ridiculously implausible. Out of all the multiverse madness, the Citadel of Ricks stands out as being one of the least realistic elements. But the most hilarious. Most of us wouldn't consider Rick and Morty enough evidence to write a scientific paper, but one scientist decided to just go for it. Farouk Ali Khan wrote a paper called Newer Tools to Fight Intergalactic Parasites and Their Transmissibility in the Zergian Simulation. Wow, try saying that three times fast, huh? The paper details the work of a scientist named Beth Smith, who painstakingly describes a new method to fight parasites which implant false memories in their host. Sound familiar? It should, since it's a part of the Rick and Morty episode Total Rickall. Obviously, parasites who survive by implanting false memories aren't real, but try telling that to the multiple scientific journals who published the paper. The point of this experiment was to expose predatory journals, which will publish pretty much anything to make a buck. While most journals realized this wasn't real science pretty quickly, several of them did not. In fact, only a single journal out of the 14 the article was submitted to even bothered to have it peer-reviewed. In total, three journals published the paper and five more claimed they would in exchange for payment. Now that you're familiar with all the things Rick and Morty got wrong, let's celebrate the things they did right by watching actual science stuff Rick and Morty got right by our good friends over at Screen Rant. We promise you won't regret it. Personally, we don't think it gets better than using Rick and Morty to trick actual scientific journals. Which non-scientifically sound moment was your favorite? And are there any we missed? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section and then click on the subscribe button for more videos from us here at CBR. Bye for now.